There are two primary ways of telling a story in wrestling, doing something which is short in length, or doing something which takes place over a series of months and possibly even years. But while both methods have their pros and cons, it's usually the latter that create the all-time great angles. But what are the best examples of long-term booking, where storylines have been given time to breathe and evolve over lengthy periods of time? Well, that's exactly what we're going to be looking at today. And where better to start than with the biggest ongoing storyline in the industry right now, and that's The Bloodline. Of course, the story of The Bloodline is, in many ways, also the story of Roman Reigns' 1,200-plus day-long world title reign, as it all begins when he returns at August 24, 2020's SummerSlam and wins the Universal title from Bray Wyatt. Why was this so significant? Well, after taking a period of absence from WWE during the lockdown, something changed in the Tribal Chief causing him to grow more paranoid about both his and his family's legacy as he realized how fragile life truly was. So at that point, he morphed into a man who ruled his people with an iron fist, something he first proved by getting his cousin Jay Uso to bend the knee to him in the months which followed. And once that was done, it was on to getting a returning Jimmy Uso to do the same, as with his wise man Paul Heyman by his side, Roman fully took control of the bloodline, and as a consequence, WWE as a whole. Yes, it was a great angle already, but it was about to turn into an all-time classic, as in the summer of 2022, two years after it began, Sami Zayn would enter the picture and would become the most lovable figure in the entire industry with his repeated attempts to become the honorary oos of the stable. Truly, you could argue this was the point WWE as a whole reached the biggest peak it's seen in decades, and it was all seemingly leading up to a major climax come WrestleMania season. But as we now know, that wouldn't be the case. No, instead of dropping the title and beginning his downfall here, the head of the table beat Sami Zayn at Elimination Chamber once he turned his back on the group, and then top contender Cody Rhodes at the Showcase of the Immortals too. But at least there was some movement in the angle during the latter show as the Usos fell to Sami and Kevin Owens on night one of that spectacle. As for what happened to the Bloodline as a collective following this, well, they'd begin the next phase of their story, the slow collapse, as Jay and Jimmy turned their back on the group, with this all leading to Jay challenging Roman at August 5th, 2023's SummerSlam. And with Roman Reigns vs. The Rock seemingly being planned for a match, possibly even at WrestleMania 40, the Bloodline storyline looks to heat up all over again. And if it does, it'll be doing one better than our next example of long-term booking, Sting vs. the NWO. That's right, back in 1996 and 1997, there was no hotter angle in wrestling than that of the NWO's hostile takeover of WCW, and part of which made it such appointment viewing was that everyone knew Sting, the last protector of WCW, was waiting there in the rafters watching everything play out, and that eventually he was going to make his move against the group. And we mean that literally because Steve Borden spent 15 months between September of 1996 and December of 1997 not taking part in a single match. Rather, he was a ghost who watched things from afar, with his reasoning for this being he hadn't made a decision as to whose side he was on yet. But once he made this decision and rappelled down from the ceiling to finally challenge NWO leader Hollywood Hogan for the WCW title at December 28, 1997 Starcade, Everyone realized all the waiting was going to be worth it. Or at least it would have been if this one had stuck the landing, but unfortunately it didn't. No, while everything that came before remained excellent, the final showdown was so horrifically botched that for many, it left a stain on the entire angle afterwards. What was botched about it? Well, Hogan technically won the match. Sure, this was because the referee forgot to do a fast count, and the planned finish of Sting winning did indeed go ahead after the bout was restarted. But everyone in attendance that night watched the babyface lose clean before this, and so because of that, it all closed out with a wet fart which followed through into something even worse over the months which followed, when the NWO just kept on going, now with the Stinger as an actual member of the group. Yes, if the NWO taught us anything, it's that no matter how great your long-term booking is, you need to have an ending worthy of the story which came before it and few long-term stories in WWE prove this better than the Mega Powers explosion. Honestly, this one is probably the best angle of the entire golden era, and the reason for that is it took two of its biggest stars and let them play something out for a full year before it reached its climax. Basically, it all began at WrestleMania 4 when, after winning a one-night tournament to become WWF Champion, Randy Savage was joined in the ring by Hulk Hogan, who wanted to celebrate with him. 
and this began a friendship between the pair which led to the formation of the Mega Powers. So now, as a formal team, the two would do what any great babyface team did best, and that was go after every heel duo the company had on the roster. And this saw them find a huge amount of success together, even if over time the apparent lust the Hulkster had in his eyes for Miss Elizabeth began to draw the ire of the Macho Man. Was there actual ill intent from Hogan here, or was it all just in Savage's paranoid head? The 13-time world champion certainly argued the latter was the case whenever his partner raised the issue, but his protests did no good in the end, because on the February 3rd, 1989 edition of the main event, the Macho Man decided he'd finally had enough, and so he turned on his partner, with this all leading to the blow-off of the decade at WrestleMania V, where the two fought each other over the WWF title. And there, the babyface rightfully got the clean win, giving the whole thing the payoff it deserved and securing the angle's status as an all-time legendary one. But it wouldn't be the only legendary long-term angle WWF carried out pre-Attitude Era. That said, in the case of Bret Hart vs. Shawn Michaels, a lot of this one happened behind the cameras. That's right, before there was CM Punk vs. The Elite, there was The Hitman vs. The Heartbreak Kid, a feud so bitter that it spilled out of the ring and right into real life. Seriously, back in the 90s, you'd be hard-pressed to find two people who legitimately hated each other more, and it all began when they faced off for the WWF title at WrestleMania 12 in March of 1996. And the reason we mark this as the beginning is because, headed into the bout, the two were still on good terms. Hell, you could argue they were actually friends. But after it was over and Sean allegedly told Brett to get the F out of his ring so he could celebrate, bad feelings started to develop between the pair. Of course, these feelings only got worse when Hart returned to the ring 10 months later following a sabbatical, all ready for the planned rematch between the two at WrestleMania 13, only for the rematch to never happen as the Heartbreak Kid was too injured to compete at the show. And things got even worse from there when, before the two could get it in the ring for the rescheduled date of June 8th, 1997's King of the Ring, Brett himself would pick up a knee injury, taking him out of action for a while. That's right, by then it felt like we'd never see the two Lockhorns ever again, especially as during that summer they'd trade on-screen barbs in promos which only deepened their hatred for one another, then at one point would get into a legitimate backstage brawl. Even though things settled down enough to the point they'd be booked to challenge one another at that November Survivor Series, and there, nothing dramatic would happen and everyone would find a happy ending to the scenario. Okay, that's not what happened, but to be perfectly honest, the Montreal Screwjob is a whole video in itself, so we won't go into full detail here. All we'll say is that once it was over, the Hitman would leave WWF under the most bitter of circumstances, and he and HBK would have no further contact for the next 13 years, at which point they finally appeared on an episode of Raw together and were able to put the past behind them. But that's not the only long-term story Shawn Michaels had to put to bed during that period, as only two years earlier he had a great one with Chris Jericho, which carried itself out over the course of most of the year. Now, we're going to have to rewind back to 2008 for this one, a period when there wasn't much going on in WWE. But there was one shining light during this year which makes it all worth checking out, and that's the program between Y2J and HBK. How did it all start? Well, after Jericho was named special guest referee for Shawn Michaels' match against Batista at April 27th's Backlash, he was determined to call things right down the middle. That said, despite being the babyface in this situation, the showstopper evidently had other plans as he'd cheat to win, something which drew the ire of the Demo God once he realized this. And that led to him having one of the most justified heel turns ever, as he spent the next few weeks trying to understand why fans were still cheering for Shawn, despite him being a clear cheater. Hell, this would even lead to a one-on-one -on -one match between the two at the following month's Judgment Day, where the supposed babyface picked up the win. Needless to say, though, that only pissed off Jericho more, and so he'd seek a rematch at July 20th's Night of Champions, one which he'd win by technical knockout after his opponent was deemed too injured to compete. Yes, in kayfabe at least, this was a severe blow to the health of the Heartbreak Kid, bad enough that he actually intended on coming out at SummerSlam the following month to announce his retirement. But when Jericho interrupted this announcement and punched Sean's wife in the eye, it lit a fire under HBK and forced him to return for another match at September 7th's Unforgiven, where this time he won via technical knockout. That said, it still wasn't the end of the story, because by the close of the evening, the Demo God would have inserted himself into the championship scramble match and walked away from it World Heavyweight Champion. So this prompted Michaels to come out the following week on TV to challenge his rival to one final bout, a ladder match for said belt. 
Who would win that one? Well, perhaps surprisingly, it would be Jericho who came out the ultimate victor after he beat HBK at October 5th No Mercy. That's right, this was a rare example of the heel winning the overall feud. But it wouldn't be the only feud towards the turn of the decade which saw the bad guy score numerous victories in a lengthy program, as it was in 2010 that the Brothers of Destruction finally put their beef to bed. Of course, this one goes all the way back to 1997, however, as it was then Kane was first introduced to audiences as the long-lost brother of The Undertaker, someone who is believed to have died in the same fire that killed their parents. And believing the dead man to have been the one who started the fire then, the Big Red Machine arrived with a bang at that October's bad blood in your house pay-per-view, intent on destroying his kayfabe sibling. At least initially though, The Undertaker would refuse to fight his own flesh and blood, with him only agreeing to finally do this after Kane tried to burn him alive inside of a casket at the following January's Royal Rumble. And that's what led to the pair having showdowns not only at WrestleMania 14, but also the following months Unforgiven in your house, both of which the Phenom won. How would things go after that? Well, in a surprising direction as it happened, because by the summer it was clear the Brothers of Destruction had found some common ground again and that they'd formed a powerhouse tag team. Unfortunately though, this team wouldn't last for long, because come the winter the dead man would turn heel on his sibling and reveal that he had indeed been the one who started that fateful fire all along. So after having two more singles matches at October's No Mercy and November's Survivor Series respectively, Kane would decide he no longer wanted to have anything to do with his brother. And that would be the end of the angle for a while up until they reformed in 2000 once again, this time as a babyface tag team. But even that wasn't the end because after going their separate ways following the draft in 2002, they'd return together once more to face off at WrestleMania 20, with The Undertaker once again winning this one. Eventually though, Kane would get the victory over his brother he'd been seeking for so many years, as in 2010, during the last leg of their by then decade-long plus feud, he'd beat the Phenom in three straight pay-per-view bouts, proving that by this point, he's earned the right to call himself the head of the household. But what of The Undertaker's other great long-term story, the one which lasted for almost 25 years? Well, to look at that in more detail, we have to dive into the world of The Streak. It all began in March of 1991 at WrestleMania 7. That was when The Undertaker made his debut at the Showcase of the Immortals by defeating Superfly Jimmy Snuka. Little did people know at the time though, this was the start of one of the longest ongoing angles the wrestling world would ever see. Sure, the first decade or so might have been a coincidence, with Mark Calloway picking up further wins over Jake the Snake Roberts, Giant Gonzalez, King Kong Bundy, Diesel, Psycho Sid, Kane, The Big Boss Man, and Triple H. But by the time he got to 10-0 after defeating Ric Flair at WrestleMania 18, then raising 10 fingers in acknowledgement of this fact, it was clear to everyone in the company that they had something special on their hands. Hell, it's what made his WrestleMania 21 bout against Randy Orton where he ultimately took things to 13-0 so exciting. And it's part of what made his mini-streak of instant show stealers between WrestleMania 23 and WrestleMania 29 so thrilling. As every year, we waited to see which new challenger was going to be the one to try and end the streak, and every year we watched them get put down by the time things were all said and done. That was until they didn't though, because at WrestleMania 30, in one of the most genuinely shocking moments in wrestling history, Brock Lesnar toppled the dead man to end his winning ways at 21-1. And with that, one of the greatest long-term angles of all time came to about as dramatic of a close as it possibly could. Seriously, you could have heard a pin drop with how silent the 60,000 people in attendance were that night, as they couldn't believe what they'd just seen. But that wasn't the only time a long-term story in New York ended in shocking fashion, as back in 1994, right when the streak was still in its infancy, Bob Backlund returned to WWF and in the process severed his partnership with his longtime manager Arnold Skolin. Now, for younger viewers, this one might require a bit of context. Basically, back in 1976, Bob Backlund was being groomed as the eventual successor to Bruno Sammartino in WWF someone who could carry the company on his back as its world champion once the Italian Superman finally decided to hang up his boots. And helping him along the way towards doing this was none other than his manager, the golden boy Arnold Skolin. Hell, so dedicated to his client was Skolin that he'd remain by his side all throughout his subsequent title reign, with him only deciding to call it a day himself once he was forced to throw in the towel and hand the Iron Sheik the title when the heel had Backlund locked in an inescapable camel clutch during a championship bout on December 26, 1983. But while Skolin might have come to terms with his decision soon thereafter, obviously Bob never forgot about it. 
And so that was why, when he returned to WWF in the mid-90s following a lengthy sabbatical, he'd have his former manager join him in the ring, and would then proceed to pay off an angle which most people had already forgotten about when he gave Arnold a beatdown right in the middle of the ring for his past sins. Yes, it was a surprise payoff to say the least but one which rewarded long-term fans for paying attention. And it helped to propel Backlund back into the title picture as it happened, because before the year was out, he'd once again be champion. This time, ironically, after his opponent Bret Hart had the towel thrown in for him. But what of a long-term story which happened around this time period which took place in another, more renegade company? How would that play out? To find the answer to this, we have to venture over to Extreme Championship Wrestling, so as to explore the saga of Tommy Dreamer vs. Raven. Really, if there was any feud which ever defined ECW, then this was the one. And in kayfabe at least, it goes all the way back to the pair's school days. That was where, as the popular jock, Dreamer often gave Raven a hard time for being an outcast, something which the Philadelphia native clearly remembered as by the time the 90s came around and they were working together in Paul Heyman's promotion, he'd set about making life a living hell for the innovator of violence. How would he do this? Well, by not only dating Beulah McGillicuddy, Dreamer's high school girlfriend, but also by beating him in literally every match the two had together. Honestly, between April of 1995 and May of 1997, the pair would have a total of 12 meetings in either singles or tag competition, and every time, it would be the heel that came out of things the victor. Obviously then, this only got fans behind Tommy Dreamer all the more, as they waited for the day he'd finally be able to beat his chief rival. And thankfully for them, that day came at last at June 6, 1997's Wrestlepalooza, as it was there that the babyface not only finally pinned the heel, but he also forced Raven out of ECW in the process as the result of a pre-match stipulation. Not that this would be the end of things between them forever though, as just two years later in 1999, they'd find themselves being forced to put their differences aside in order to team up and get the tag team titles off the Dudley boys before they left to go to WWF. And after that, when the two were both under either the WWE or the TNA banner, they'd have a couple of more single bouts for old time's sake. Hell, who knows, we might even see them lock up again before all is said and done. One pairing we'll probably never get to see in the ring at this point, however, is our next example of long-term booking, and that's the story of Daniel Bryan versus The Miz. Yes. Well, his time in Ring of Honor was mostly defined by his bouts against the likes of Nigel McGuinness, and his time in AEW has been largely defined by his inclusion in the Blackpool Combat Club. Over in the WWE, arguably the most memorable part of Daniel Bryan's run there in terms of a long-term angle was his ongoing beef with The Miz. And it all started during his run on the first season of NXT, back when it was still in its original game show format in 2009. As it was there, the best wrestler in the world was assigned Mike Mizanin, of all people, to be his mentor. Obviously then, this pretty quickly led to the American Dragon exceeding The Miz when he beat him for the United States title in September of the following year. But that wouldn't be the end of the beef between the two, because years later in 2016, after Brian had been forced into temporary retirement, Mizanin cut a work shoot promo on him during an episode of Talking Smack, which reignited the legitimate dislike the pair had of one another. In fact, Danielson has since confirmed he originally planned to punch The Miz for real at this point, as he wanted to get fired so he could go work somewhere else like Japan, where they would clear him to wrestle again. But in the end, he didn't do this. No, he waited until WWE allowed him to step in the ring in 2018, as it was then that the company booked the two to resume their feud, with it this time seeing three matches take place across August's SummerSlam, September's Hell in a Cell, and November's Crown Jewel. And in the end, it was the American Dragon who came out of things the ultimate victor, with his final victory earning him a shot at AJ Styles' WWE title, a title he'd go on to win from the phenomenal one. So it just goes to show the benefits a well-told long-term story can have on a performer, as not only can it be great for them while it's happening, but it can also benefit them in the way they're booked in the future.